welcome everyone to week four at Cambridge and our fourth debate at the Cambridge Union. The motion before the House tonight is this House has had enough of experts. In a post-COVID era with soaring interest rates and staggering amounts of te um, technocratic jargon, should we put our faith in the hands of the expert? We're here tonight to find out. Um, I see quite a lot of new faces in the room, so I'm going to quickly run through debate format, but it's our fourth time, so I will be quite fast. Um, we've got three wonderful paper speakers tonight. They're going to speak for 10 minutes. Their first and last minute are protected. But at any time, other than that, please feel free to get up and say point information or on that point. It's up to them whether they accept, but I've strongly encouraged them to, so I hope we'll have a very interactive debate tonight. If you don't want to make point information, but you do want to speak, you've also got floor speeches. After every pair of speeches, so a prop speech and an op speech, I will turn to you, the members, to make floor speeches interjections. Here you can stand up and give a one-minute speech in favour of proposition, opposition, or even abstention. Um, with that being said, I think we'll proceed straight ahead with the debate. Um, first to speak is Johan Anderberg. Johan is a Swedish writer and journalist who has been a regular contributor to a number of Swedish and international media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal. His recent book, The Herd, highlights Sweden's experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. Johan, you have the ears of the house. Mr. President, uh, Madam President, sorry. <laughs> I just copied someone else's opening. Uh, members of this union, thank you for inviting me here. So in proposing this motion, I would like to go back two and a half years. In March of 2020, when a new virus from China spread in Europe, a few old men in Stockholm started writing emails to each other. What was going on, they asked. That question wasn't so much directed at the virus itself, but at the different measures that experts and policymakers around Europe now took. These experts, for some reason, stopped kids from going to school. They closed bars and restaurants, they made politicians go deep in debt, mortgaging generations to come, just because they were under the impression that some perfect mix of policy proposals could keep the virus at bay. Man, this was crazy, they thought. There was no way that this Chinese solution of shutting down society would work here in Europe, or in China for that matter. These emailers would eventually get pretty famous around the world, as they were the ones that decided what Sweden would do during the pandemic. Perhaps you remember their names, Anders Tegnell, and so on. And perhaps you remember what they did. Almost nothing. They refused to lock down society. They kept preschools and most schools open. They didn't force masks on anyone. They pretty much relied on people's common sense. So how did it go? I'll, I'll tell you in a bit, but let's stay in 2020 for just a little while. Because what we had here was a massive experiment. It was not a perfectly designed one, for sure, but still. So we have lots of countries on this side, like masking up, closing schools, and one country doing nothing. We have a control group. So you think that the pandemic experts of the world, as well as journalists, would have welcomed this, that they would have taken an objective interest in how it's going. So you just follow what was going on. That's not quite how it turned out. Instead, a host of prestigious newspapers and TV channels from all around the world came to Sweden and sent back stories that described the country as something of a populist nation turning its back on science. Of course, the people in charge of this alternative strategy, they were scientists too. Experts, if you will. They just had a different opinion. They just interpreted the facts in a different way. So, who was right? Was it the thousands of experts around the world who condemned the strategy? Or was it these stubborn old men, these emailers, who preferred to rely on people's common sense? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. 
Do you think Germany is a socially economic comparably comparable country to Sweden? Do you think Germany is comparable to Sweden? I'll, I'll address these things in a, in a bit. Um, well, thank you. Um, okay, so when Eurostat measured excess mortality for the whole of 2020, Sweden ended up in 22nd place out of 30 countries. If Sweden was a US state, it would rank 43 of the 50 states. And when the World Health Organization re recently summarized two years of the pandemic, it turned out that Sweden had around half the average excess death rate compared to UK, the Ger uh, Germany, uh, Spain, and Italy. Um, of course, Dem uh, Denmark, Finland, and Norway ha has slightly lower death rates. But still, w when you look at Denmark, Denmark is, was actually also one of the mo more open countries in Europe. Would you agree on that? <laughs> these numbers haven't been widely reported, which is understandable. All those experts, all those journalists, all those pundits who cheered the lockdowns on are, of course, reluctant to realize that millions of people lived unfree for nothing. Millions of kids and young adults, many of, your, uh, many of you also, had their education disrupted, all for nothing. And experts at Britain's own Imperial College whose predictions for the Swedish death toll have been wrong by 2,000%. We're suddenly very quiet. In a way, it isn't too surprising how it all played out. After all, it was experts who dug down in Vietnam. It was experts who created the banking rules that brought the world economy to the brink of collapse in 2008. It was experts who printed all that money that caused the massive inflation that we're now living through. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think that um, the whole thing is that you shouldn't trust experts too much. To like these experts, they weren't. Many of these experts weren't just looking at epidemiology. Many of them were talking about how this would affect restaurants and and so on. So the, they were the ones that took a more holistic approach. So it's definitely possible for experts to do this as well. But I think it would be easier for politicians to do, the, to do that. Here. Yeah. You said the people who caused the inflation were experts in the investment community. Are you referring to world class and middle class and experts? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Boris Johnson was the one that started printing money in 2008. The thing here is that there is nothing divine about expert knowledge. The unwillingness to admit mistakes made during COVID show that experts and scientists are just as unwilling to change opinions in light of new facts as anyone else's. Experts also have careers to protect, mortgages to pay. They are subject to the same mental fallacies as we all are. So the problem isn't perhaps experts, but the belief that they can somehow transcend politics. That is why we should welcome the uprising against expert rule. Not just brand it as populism or as anti-science, but see it as part of our democracy. And for that reason, I commend this motion to the House. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan, for such a fine speech. I now like to invite Katie Patamel to take the floor. Katie is a doctoral candidate in medicine at Murray Edwards College, having obtained a Master of Science in Molecular and Cellular Biology from the University of Glasgow. She won the right to speak through open audition. Katie, you have the ears of the house.
Madam President, and all of you for having me today here to speak. It's an incredible honor, especially as someone who's not a native speaker, to have made it this far. So, to the motion. One of the great challenges in the world is knowing enough about a subject to think that you're right, but not enough about a subject to know that you're wrong. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Have you ever been in that situation where you had to write an essay and because you, know, you barely had any time and you went to a party last night, you decide, I'll just do this about something that I know a lot about, you know, that subject I know so much. And then as you start doing your research and you learn more and more and more, it becomes harder and harder because you start to realize the boundaries of your own ignorance. Well, that effect is actually has a name. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It is when people of little knowledge overestimate their ability and knowledge in a certain subject, whereas people who are objectively judged to be experts underestimate their ability. In a nutshell, it's what happens when you're in UPM called List Trust trying to fix all of Britain's problems overnight using a mini budget. Why am I bringing this up? Well, I'm bringing it up because we all know that the debate tonight is not really about experts. Otherwise, we would have to be comfortable with science being done without experiments, history without books, archaeology without excavations, and even in the most fringy internet circles, one will be hard-pressed to find people who actually believe that. What we have heard from the proposition tonight is, you know, not so much um, objection, like, I'm not... I'm not, it's not an objection to studies or expertise as such. Otherwise, it would be difficult to explain, you know, Johan referring to Tengel, who, you know, even if he refers to them as old man writing emails, you know, an epidemiologist must be called an expert. I don't know what else you want to call them. Um, in other words, the underlying question up for debate tonight is not, do we believe that we need experts to build a functioning and productive society, but rather, must we trust the expert consensus? Or can we, with university YouTube and college Wikipedia right at our fingertips, legitimately take a me and my experts approach? What do I mean with me and my experts? I'm referring to the assumption that because information is widely available through the internet and we are rational creatures, we are intuitively able to educate ourselves to A, discern what an expert consensus on any given topic is, and B, challenge this consensus based on our own research and the good old common sense. On face value, that sounds like a reasonably enough proposition, doesn't it? I'm sure most of us here are frequenters on YouTube. I know all of you guys that are watching online clearly are. And we all use Google Scholar, etc. for our research. So what is the difference between researching for a uni essay and researching for your own pleasure in general education? Why do we need universities like this one, when seemingly we can achieve the same kind of expertise just by using the internet? Why must we trust experts, at least in some specialized areas, rather than making up our own mind? Trust people who perhaps just want to scare us, who may even have an ulterior agenda? To answer that, let's turn back once again to the COVID-19 pandemic, as John, where John is already taking us. Because it's my experience of that time which really convinced me of the importance of auditioning for tonight's debate. <laughs> when I first arrived here in the summer of 2020 and met my new colleagues in the lab, the first thing that I noticed about them was about how tired they all looked. Tired? Because whilst everyone had been told to stay at home, they had been working without a break, day and night, weekends, in front of their screens in the laboratory, trying to understand this new virus that was seemingly shutting down the whole world. None of them got a salary rise. Indeed, they haven't even gotten a salary adjustment accounting for inflation yet. Almost none got promoted. And whilst there are one or two professors who achieved something akin to fame, the great majority of them, who are all, all those who did the legwork, including most of the professors, got no recognition whatsoever for their work during COVID. For them to have had an ulterior motive is unbelievable, simply because there is no motive, like there was nothing to gain. There was nothing in for them. Nothing apart from ex gaining expertise and knowledge regarding a novel pathogen from China, which had caused the pandemic. The second thing which struck me was how careful they all were when discussing anything related to COVID. Not once have I heard them make quick, undifferentiated judgments on anti-COVID policies, lockdowns, vaccines, etc. Whenever a judgment was being made, 
It was unspeculative, based on real data and on an aspect of COVID management which was clearly within their competence. And yet I've experienced myself how great the temptation and pressure was to exceed that competence, to speculate, to deliver answers, the certainties which we all long for. Being of a more conservative political bent myself, I had quite a few friends who soon enough turned to COVID and vaccine skepticism. And through conversations and text exchanges I had with them, I realized how difficult it is to communicate the scientific method, statistical probabilities, and data to lay people. What would typically happen, especially in connection to the vaccine, is that people would start to set YouTube videos, blogs, anecdotes about people suffering from severe myocarditis, which had deeply scared them. And then they would end up backing it up with the title of a scientific paper they found somewhere online, which suggested that the conclusions agreed with them. So I would then end up spending the rest of the day examining that paper and asking them, well, but what about the data collection method? What about the statistical model? What about the size of the study group? What about this fact that this study was conducted in Sweden or Israel, which has completely different population dynamics, is fighting, was fighting a different variant at the time than we are, and, ha and where people have a different genetic makeup, et cetera, et cetera. I would often be asked to comment on vaccine trial data, and those questions would be really, really hard to answer. Because as a scientist, I can't go beyond the data. I can't give someone the certainty they long for and which they unconsciously perceive to get from YouTube doctors, etc. I couldn't tell someone that they would under no circumstances ever suffer from any side effects from the vaccine. Because any medicine known to man can possibly cause side effects. That is just fact. So of course the COVID trial data showed that too. But that wasn't good enough, because the doctors on YouTube seem to keep telling them that it's almost certain they would die, that it's almost certain they would suffer from severe side effects, using much stronger language than I would ever dare to when discussing scientific data. Language which appeared to justify an adherence to a particular stance on a scientific topic with a political, sometimes almost religious zeal. Something which I've observed, by the way, on both sides of the debate, so I'm not trying to pick on a particular group here. There's a lot of information out there. Some of it is true, some isn't. Some is com being communicated clearly. Some is accidentally being misquoted. Some, sometimes it's being twisted and turned to fit into the mold of the ideology of the authors trying to communicate it. Sadly, it's often really hard to tell what kind of data and information is what. The problem with free online content is that its great strength is also its greatest weakness, crowdfunding. Social media influencers make money by being popular and getting clicks as well as by attracting patrons which pay for them and buy merchandise. The strength of that system is we have complete control over who we want to support with our money. The weakness is that it is not accurate information that is being rewarded, but rather content which elicits an emotional response, as Laura very rightly turns, um, points out in the new book, uh, State of Fear, which I'm sure you're going to hear a lot about. Have you ever compared one of Jordan Peterson's early videos or online lectures to his more recent content? Have you noticed how much more angry he sounds in his recent content? How much more blatant his statements are? This is a perfect example of an academic expert increasingly being turned into a populist and ideologue by social media. And when that conversion from scientific objectivity to ideological subjectivity happens to data, to scientific questions rather than just people, we are in for a bad right. Because it means that, for example, healthcare decisions are no longer made on the basis of medicine with the patient's health at heart, but rather on the basis of political ideology, which care little about the health of a particular individual. If anyone's trying to make a point of information, please scream because I won't be able to see you, okay? So, yeah, please go. Well, I agree with that, but the problem is he still styles himself as a professor, so he still uses that air of academic expert when he no longer is one, or is speaking about topics that he's no expert in, which can be very misleading. So, yes. Isn't it just very, um, enough for experts, and then at some point, we need to just make decisions, just take it beyond what experts 
Well, I think that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think that's why I'm trying to advocate for expert consensus. Because the thing is, you know, of course, one expert by themselves is not going to be able to solve all of our problems. But by having a community of experts that agree and exchange ideas, such as, you know, Matt suggests in his TED talk, like when ideas have sex, you know, when, when people all know their specialized idea or do a specialized thing, and they're able to put that all together, that's when we get progress. And so, I, like, what I'm advocating for, simply, is the idea that we can't just pick and choose with which experts we want to listen to. We need to take everything into account when we make a decision. And that's the problem with populism. You end up just picking your favorite experts and then going by that, whether or not they are right or not. One second, one second. Yes. Do you know that experts are uh, the ones that took uh, America to Iraq to have the war? Experts who said that there is a nuclear war in Iraq? You said you should listen to some of the experts, take them all and have a consensus that some experts are very prob problematic. I'm not trying to say that all experts are always going to be correct. I think experts need to have humility and there are like mistakes that are going to be made. We're never going to arrive at a perfect system. But I think the like rate of mistakes is going to be lower if we trust experts rather than if we try to banish them from our society. And I can't comment on the Iraq war because I'm not a, polit like a politician or a political scientist. They have absolutely no expertise in that subject. So I'm not going to be making a statement about something I know nothing about. <laughs> I think I should get to the end now. Um, I hope by now I have uh, convinced you that experts are incredibly important for our society. Um, so please vote, vote in opposition of this motion. And before I finish, one last thing. If you think that facts rather than fear should prevail, please support your lecturers as they're going to strike this winter. Because at the moment, academics in this country are paid not almost like almost uh, just above the poverty line and then not getting inflation and if you want <laughs> objective research to keep being a thing support them and make the university pay for every single minute of teaching you lose because it's only when it's expensive for them that they're finally going to give in thank you Thank you so much, Katie, for that fine speech. It's a rare thing in this chamber to people not speak on things we're not experts on, so it was, it was very refreshing. I turn now to you, the members, um, for our first round of floor speeches. Would anyone like to speak in proposition of the motion? Just there. If you could wait for Mike to get your individual name in college, that'd be wonderful. Hi, my name's Katie, and I'm at Darwin College. Um, so I think that one specific problem that happens when we overvalue experts is sometimes we lose ethnographic opinions of regular people and create a disconnect between the elites and reality. Specifically, I think that this is most pronounced in um, the study of different minorities. I think that focusing on expert opinions oftentimes leads to like this massive disconnect. Like for instance, I know that academia has a history of not being very accessible, specifically to women and people of color. And while much of that is beginning to change, thank heavens, there is still huge boundaries in terms of what is considered expertise. And in a world where that is the case, I think that it is fair to advocate for more research, for more specific like listening to opinions and political thought from regular people like activists, regular people who have strong thoughts. And by listening to things like public opinion, as well as listening to people who come from more diverse backgrounds, I think that experts have the ability to also take and receive knowledge in a way that academically is not oftentimes accepted. And so I think when we this house say that we have had enough of experts, I think that that has the ability to also decenter whiteness, decenter class, and instead center voices that are not accepted in academia or are oftentimes suppressed. Thank you so much for such an interesting contribution to the debate. I really appreciate that. Could we turn now to um, points in abstention? You, I saw you first um, on the back. Thanks. Okay. Uh, name and college, if possible. Uh, James Tanaka Fawson Trinity. 
So I'm going to be honest, uh, I came in expecting to uh, agree with the opposition for this speech, uh, because I do believe that experts are very important. Uh, and that belief persisted basically until the op first opposition speaker stood up, and she misdefined the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, so <laughs> for those who don't know, the Dunning-Kruger effect refers to a, specifically the study of uh, a negative correlation between confidence in your ability and the measured ability, whether that's uh, judged by other people or measured in some objective way. Uh, the first speaker for the opposition made it sound like it was due to uh, some kind of knowledge. Even if you have some kind of innate ability in something, learning might not affect that. There is a separate academic study of the effect of knowledge on confidence. That's a whole other thing. Um, this brings me to my main point, which is that knowledge is really specific. Expertise is really specific. Um, and people who you would have thought are experts in one thing might not turn out to be an expert in that thing. They might, even, even if they seem like uh, two things which seem to be exactly the same, might turn out to be separate. So uh, we've been talking about COVID. Um, a recent example, uh, I know quite a few people, just uh, by coincidence from living in Cambridge, who are involved in drug research. Um, <laughs> no? No one else? Okay. Um, so people who are involved in drug research, you would have thought, know a lot about drugs. And they do. They know about researching drugs. They do not know anything about testing the efficacy of those drugs. They do not know anything about how those drugs are in practice used. I know people who are involved in drug research on really uh, famous drugs, if that's a thing, that, 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 that exists, you know, really popular drugs, really trendy drugs, who refuse to take the COVID vaccine. Because from their point of view, as drug researchers, they spend all this time developing something, and they put it into the system, and then 10 years later it gets approved. Right? It is, it is a, a, an aspect of the world, it is a base assumption of the way that they engage with uh, drug research that it takes a long time to get anything approved. And so when the, uh, when the approval process is expedited, they say this has got to be bullshit, this can't be real, it must be, it must be dodgy, it must be corrupt. Therefore, I'm not going to take the vaccine until we have the 10 years of data that I normally have. They're not experts in the same thing that they think they are. This comes up in all sorts of places. Even with really similar uh, situations, the Three Mile Island nuclear accident was caused by experts in naval nuclear uh, reactors, so on nuclear submarines, taking that expertise and applying it into the area of large-scale uh, electricity-producing reactors for the commercial grid. It's a whole different situation. And when you get these kinds of situations, uh, you can end up with a lot of cock-ups, like nuclear accidents. Um, so, so I'm going to agree with what the, the, the first speaker for the um, uh, proposition said in this one case, which is uh, you should not expect experts to be above ideology. You should not just listen to them blindly. Um, if someone has a study, uh, if, if someone's presenting some kind of results about epidemiology or whatever, uh, you should not take that as an invitation to just listen to whatever they're saying and shut up. You should take that as an invitation to learn more yourself. Uh, because that's always going to be a good thing. It's never going to hurt, uh, and I don't really care which way you vote. So that's me. Thank you so much for a really insightful speech. Um, I turn now to opposition. You were very fast up in the rafters. Can we get you a mic up? Hello. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Leo uh, from Harvard. Oh, sorry. I might be getting too loud. Okay. okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, right. Okay. So I think one of the largest problems that we have when we're dealing with these, you know, experts is that, like, you know, it's because of the media portrayal of experts, okay? We live in a day and age where the word expert has become clickbait. Let me read you some headlines I found uh, of these so-called experts talking about stuff, okay? Uh, experts say six bars of chocolate a week could cut the risk of common heart condition. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, experts say we cannot ignore conspiracy theories anymore. Gee, thank you so much for telling me this. And the most important one, this was two days ago. Experts say you shouldn't bag your leaves in the fall. Okay, I, I, I'm just as confused as all of you, okay? <laughs> like, what? No, the point is that we live in such a saturated media world that the word experts has been synonymous with things that don't really make sense, and that is a large contributor to why we don't really trust experts anymore. And I don't think we should let this kind of media-saturated world cloud our judgment about the true value of experts because they're not intrinsically horrible people bent on 
trying to make society a worse place, you know? Like most of, a lot of them are, have it in the right place. It's just sometimes we can easily be misguided. So I want the house to remember that simple point and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll turn now back to our paper speakers and to Laura Dodsworth. Laura is a writer, photography, and author of the Sunday Times bestseller, A State of Fear, How the UK Government Weaponized Fear During the COVID-19 Pandemic, as well as the Bear Reality series. She's written for the Sunday Times, The Telegraph, and The Spectator, among others. Her new book is out in May 2023. Laura, you have the ears of the house. It's a great honour to be invited to speak here today about a subject which has been very close to my heart for the past few years. Lockdowns were encouraged through a mass communications campaign, behavioural science, nudge, propaganda, the most punitive fines since the Dark Ages, and all stirred on by the experts. Now, the way I coped with my loss of freedom was through free expression. And I wrote a book about, uh, which explored the way that the government mobilized fear to encourage compliance in the population. To come here where free speech is so greatly prized is a privilege and nerve wracking. Um, I hope to persuade you that the involvement of experts in the past couple of years has had lasting damage on our lives. I'm going to start with a couple of general points about experts before I move on to my favourite experts, the behavioural scientists. First of all, I am not going to suggest that we've had enough of all experts, of course. There have been some excellent points made already um, about that. At one end of this spectrum, we've got members of society who can do things which others cannot. Um, car mechanics, airline pilots, civil engineers, but they don't tell us that they are the science or that we must follow the science. They just quietly get on with being experts fixing our carburettors, flying us around and building bridges. No, they're not the experts we should be wary of. The experts that we should be wary of are the ones who appear daily on the television, demanding the eradication of a virus, or the experts who weaponized fear, or the experts who wondered if they could get away with lockdowns. Okay. Certainly there is, well, the motion... It's probably even a minute in. Go on. Yeah, we are. Okay. Oh, <laughs> you were waiting to pounce. <laughs> a little bit. Um, the motion refers specifically to expertise, not to experts. That is the ideal of expertise, having more knowledge, not individuals who are just as well. I think it's experts, not expertise. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> oh, right. I'm going to continue, but thank you. Uh, thank you. You can co you come come back at me at the end if I'm wrong. Right, we're adding a bit of time on, right? Okay. It, I'm reminded of the scene in The Life of Brian where Reg, who's the leader of the oppressed people's front of Judea, asks, what have the Romans ever done for us? Some of you look far too young to have seen that. I hope you know the sketch I mean. Anyway, there are so many answers that eventually he has to say, all right, but apart from the sanitation, the, medication, uh, the, the medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation roads, a freshwater system, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Now, all achievements of Roman experts, no doubt. But did the Judeans want Roman-imposed experts, or did they want freedom? We'll come back to that. The experts I think we've had enough of are the ones who wish to make us change our behaviour for our own good. The type who sprung up everywhere during COVID and who covertly manipulated us into doing things we would not otherwise do. The second general point I want to make is that experts are by definition highly specialised and that's important. Leaders, on the other hand, need to lead and when they abrogate responsibility for leadership to the experts and to the science, the result can be chaos and authoritarianism. Democracy is weakened. Your grandmother is left to die without seeing her family, without anybody holding her hand, maybe without being read the last rites. Because of an expert who advocates for zero COVID for the greater good. Okay. Oh, there was a lady that said it first, but I was just mid-sentence. <laughs>
Well, thank, thank you for that point. I do partly agree. I'm very familiar with all of the pandemic planning um, as part of the research for my book. And actually, if that expert advice had been followed, then we would have huge PPE stocks. PPE is not just for the people who work in the care homes. It's also for the people who visit their loved ones. It's also so that you can say goodbye to the deceased. And we did have a PPE problem. Um, as I said in my opener, my problem is not with all experts but I haven't yet got into laying into my favorite sort of expert, so just give me a bit of time. Experts can stop serving the people and they can become their masters, and it does blur the normal boundaries of society and morality. And I think the sense of power can be intoxicating for some, especially when it comes with practically no accountability to the public. Think of Dr. Anthony Fauci when he said, they're really criticizing science because I represent science, that's dangerous. Of course, the real danger to scientific method lies in that grandiosity and not the people who criticized him. The point was made eloquently by young Winston Churchill in a letter to H.G. Wells, and he said, Nothing would be more fatal than for the government of states to get into the hands of experts. Expert knowledge is limited knowledge. And the unlimited ignorance of the plain man who knows only what hurts is a safer guide than any vigorous direction of a specialized character. In other words, by living life, we obtain the practical judgment and capacity we need to make our own decisions and our own interests. So with those expert warnings established, I'm now gonna spend my closing minutes touching on the murky world of behavioral science and nudge. A world which provides us with ample evidence of how experts have overstepped their boundaries. And often that's been with the connivance of our elected politicians and their officials. Now they cast themselves as paternalistic libertarians. And I'm just gonna skip on because I, I, I've got more to get through. Am I, is my 10 minutes doing all right? Okay, oh, go on then. Let's have another. It seems like an awfully weird target of your anger. Your anger is because you're trying to save lives. Why are we getting angry at people like anti vaxxers or people undermining that guidance who actively put lives at risk, often to do with your agenda? Why is your anger focused at people trying to save lives rather than those politicians who are recklessly endangering them? actually not very angry at all. You seem a little angry on the other hand. Um, <laughs> and, and, if, and if I may, the anti-vaxxers you're referring to are probably not the experts or the experts I'm talking about. Okay, so um, the behavioral scientists, they cast themselves as paternalistic libertarians, but be aware because as friendly and benevolent as they seem, they all share one goal and it's to nudge you to do what they think is best. Cass Sunstein coined the term nudge to describe a way of employing psychological techniques to manipulate people into making certain choices. And he described it as follows. By knowing how people think, we can make it easier for them to choose what is best for them, their families, and society. Isn't it wonderful? There are people who know what's best for us. The UK's nudge unit was originally set up to alter your behavior and thinking in order to improve compliance with government policy and thereby reduce social and government costs. And you may ask, what's wrong with this? Well, these experts promise to preserve choice when they nudge, but in fact, they compromise individual agency and sovereignty because the success of what they do depends upon the subject of nudge being unaware of what is done to them. In fact, if you know you're being nudged, the nudge has already failed. Nudges are covert and they work below the level of consciousness. Now this is underhand, it's sinister even. Democracy is about enacting the will of the people and nudge is about changing the will of the people. These experts are fundamentally anti-democratic. And if we allow ourselves to be nudged into being good citizens, we have given up, at least in part, in defining what good means. To be an expert in a field, you usually have to be highly conscientious, hardworking, and often quite cooperative and agreeable. 
Now, normally this is good, but it does mean they're very likely to follow norms and authority. And this might explain some of the China envy we saw in UK experts. Psychologists recognize authority and social conformity as cognitive biases, and they leverage it to the hilt. I'm sure you've all heard of the Milgram experiments. In effect, you're more likely to kill somebody with an electric shock if somebody in a white lab coat tells you to. This bias is celebrated as if it were a good thing. And anyone who doesn't have the bias is an inconvenient deviant, disrupting conformity. And that is rather odd. Bringing us back to COVID, the nudges talked about how masks were a signal and that the British public would do the heavy lifting of enforcement. The consequences can be severe. One anonymous psychologist who spoke to me said that the fear they deliberately weaponized was dystopian and ethically questionable. But I can hear the objection. Nudge can produce generally beneficial effects for the mass of people, can't it? I'm going to end with br three brief examples from recent history to demonstrate the dangers. First of all, the UK suffered the worst COVID anxiety syndrome in Europe, where people were locked into psychological distress. I know from my own interviews that people were quite undone by fear, and they felt furious when they had the sense they'd been manipulated. There was the teenage girl who started self-harming, the paramedic who told me about the people who talked down from bridges, the man who became an, an ag 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 agoraphobe, and the list goes on. Secondly, the US and the UK governments are currently investigating the use of behavioral science and nudge on consumer behavior because they have found it to be deceptive, to disrupt choice, and to reduce competition. Although, this is a case of governments in glass houses because the very um, choice architecture they indict in private companies, they deploy themselves. And then thirdly, one report into HMRC's loan charge scandal concluded that the nudge approach to reclaiming taxes at least indirectly contributed to mental health problems and suicide. To conclude, David Halpern, the head of the nudge unit, said in an interview, I know everyone likes to say we're sick of the experts, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Well, I think people would be very sick if they just knew how much nudge they'd consumed. And it didn't stop with COVID. The behavioral scientists continue with experiments to get children in Welsh schools to eat insects. They have encouraged broadcasters to change the style of news and weather reports to encourage more climate fear. They're telling banks how to nudge us towards electric cars. And it brings me back to the People's Front of Judea. Their question was rhetorical, but it came from an instinctive and a populist position because it revealed dislike and resentment. People do not want to be overruled. They want the freedom to choose. What have the experts ever done for us? I would say they've done too much. In the last couple of years, they damaged our mental health, the economy, and our democracy. And that's why I say this house has had enough of experts. Thank you so much, Laura, for such a fascinating speech. Order! If we could have quiet for the speakers, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. I move now across the floor and to Cameron Abassi. Cameron is editor-in-chief of the BMJ, the leading UK medical journal and one of the top four medical journals in the world. The BMJ publishes groundbreaking medical science, news investigations, and clinical education. He's also editor of the Journal of Royal Science and Medicine. Cameron is a doctor, journalist, editor, and broadcaster. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and has consulted for major, many major organizations, including the NHS, Harvard University, and WHO. Cameron, you have the ears of the house. Thank you very much. It's a real privilege uh, to be here today to talk about such an important issue. Um, if you excuse me, I'm going to wear my reading glasses, so if you've got a point of information, please speak up. I might not see you, but I hope I will certainly hear you. Um, I, mean, I came to debate um, whether the House has had enough experts, but we seem to be debating the pros and cons of lockdown uh, and Sweden's health policy. Um, so if I could pull us back to the debate that we were supposed to be having, which is a debate about experts. And I'd like to begin with a definition 
because I think one of the issues here is, is defining who is an expert and defining expertise. Many people profess themselves to be experts. And many of those people are not experts because they don't draw on the evidence. So I'm sure what you'd expect me to say, coming from the BMJ and the world of science, is that a true expert is somebody who is evidence-based. And they're the experts that I want to argue for. And what we have to understand is that ever since the medical profession began or public health began, there have been real, powerful, strong disagreements based on the evidence. And there are to this day. So whether you're for or against something does not mean that you are or you are not an expert. It's how you debate the evidence in relation to that. So I've got it. I could put it there. Hang on. Thank you. Okay. So let's look at a couple of the points that have been raised so far. Johan raised the point about Sweden. Now, Sweden is a celebrated case. I haven't read his book. I'd love to read his book. Perhaps I should read his book. Um, but a very sensible and correct point was made that actually, if you look at the correct comparators, which is the other Nordic countries, it's very clear that Sweden's outcomes were not as good as comparable na nations. And that's important. And why it's important is because Sweden, as other Nordic countries, has went into the pandemic, unlike the UK, with very, very good baseline population health and very narrow inequalities. That was a big difference between Sweden and the UK and other countries. Well, I think you've had your say. <laughs> so, that's one point. And you also raised the point about schools. You had a powerful point about schools. I mean, there's strong disagreement about policy around schools. Now, the reality is, a bit like lockdown, I have not spoken to an expert on either, perceived to be on either side of the debate, who was either pro-closing schools or was pro-lockdown. And what you have to understand is that lockdowns and school closures were actually a direct result of policy failure in whichever country they had to be enforced. Now, we had almost 200,000 excess deaths in the UK. I cannot imagine what that number would have been if we had not locked down at all or or tried to control transmission during the last two years. Already, 200,000 deaths are on the conscience of the policymakers in this country, although they don't, do not want to be held accountable for those deaths. But I hope the inquiry that's taking place will hold them accountable. Now, Laura made a point about being guided by the science. Actually, we wrote an editorial about this a couple of months ago. We've got an inquiry ongoing. We're publishing papers in relation to, to COVID in the BMJ. And in that editorial, I wrote with two professors from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, I think who we would consider to be evidence-based experts. And we said, throughout the pandemic, politicians and their scientific advisors insisted that decision-making would be guided by science. However, evidence is socially constructed and can be highly contested. Different sources and indeed, and indeed different types of evidence are given different weight in developing policy. It is important to consider whose science counts and why. Now that statement is important because the government chose to follow the advice of the, the scientists who were advising them. Okay, at times it followed their advice and actually 
There are many, many occasions during the pandemic when the government did not follow, you've read the papers, I'm sure you must have read this, they did not follow the advice of the scientists that were advising the government. And I could name you a very long list. It begins with the timing of the first lockdown, the timing of the second lockdown and possible um, circuit breaker, which our very own Prime Minister now opposed, actively opposed, went against the advice of the Chief Medical Officer. Um, it also relates to when we eased up restrictions earlier this year. And there, there, there's a long list of examples where advice was not followed and it led to more deaths and more harm that, than, than it needed to. Part of this debate relates to democracy and populism. And democracies had a mixed pandemic. New Zealand, South Korea, their democracies, they had very few deaths comparatively. than the UK, which was seventh in the list of deaths in the world. Number three was India, number two was Brazil, number one was US. Now what do those countries have in common? They have very much populist governments. And they're, sorry? Yeah. Well, governments that are enacting the will of the people, not necessarily listening to expertise, following a right-wing agenda, those kinds of governments. Is it, is it horrible for governments to listen to the will of the people? A, no. Can you, can you think of no other uh, difference between New Zealand and America that would make it even more difficult to keep a disease disease off a small island? Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. America's challenge was far greater. But actually, the way it responded and still responds to the pandemic has been abysmal. You only need to speak to policymakers, professionals, professors of public health in the US. Um, yes, there's a difference between New Zealand and the US, but it should not have been to the, to the degree that it is. Okay, and that is, uh, that is, that's accepted. But the response to the US has been absolutely appalling. Um, so. The evidence actually suggests that if you move from towards a more populist type of government, and this is, a, a, you know, this is in research papers, including one in the International Journal of Health Policy and Management, that among the worst performing during the pandemic are those that have risen to power on populist agendas, such as the UK, Brazil, Russia, India, and the United States. Populist leaders have tended to blame others for the pandemic, such as immigrants, other governments, and denied evidence and shown contempt for institutions that generate it. So there's been a, a move to not listen to how science was generated or take a plurality of view among scientists. So we're not saying you only listen to the scientists that advise you, you should also listen to the scientists that may not be advising you directly and hear what the alternative questions are and the alternative options are. So, to come to the, to the heart of this, we need experts because experts synthesize evidence, they synthesize policy, they support politicians, they support decision makers, and they support democracy. They support democracy by providing another view on the political decision making that actually helps populations hold their governments accountable. And that is what has been sorely missing during this pandemic. You tell me how accountable some of the governments I've mentioned are or have been, and the answer is self-evident. And I'll finish with a quote from a political scientist from the US and from Europe, and we published the paper a few weeks ago in the BMJ, and they were arguing that, yes, we need more expertise, more expert advice for governments, 
but it needs to be more transparent and more independent and more evidence-based. So we need more of that kind of expertise, those experts and that advice. And their quote is, perhaps the pandemic teaches us that the best way we can hope for, the best we can hope for is scientific advice that is useful to well-intentioned governments and allows others to hold governments accountable when they make specious claims about following the science. The political role of transparent scientific advice is not just to enable policy making, it is also to enable accountability for failures such as the ones we saw in the COVID-19 pandemic. 200,000 excess deaths speak for themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cameron, for the excellent speech. I now turn back to you, our members, for a final round of floor speeches. Would anyone like to speak in proposition of the motion? I saw your hand first in the fourth row. Right. Oh, that's loud. Oh, yeah. Um, my name is Sal and I'm at Homerton. So first off, I think it's kind of ironic that the side of the debate arguing against experts is actually made up solely of experts. Because I wanted to apply for the proposition, but there you go. <laughs> I'm just going to give my speech anyways in a shorter format. Um, so this house has had enough of experts. That's a Michael Gove quote, right? 2016 Sky News debate. Um, and five minutes into that debate, th there's a pretty interesting exchange that goes on. Um, it starts off with the interviewer saying, in quite a haughty tone, I'm, I'm going to try another one of my impressions. Well, all our allies, the US, the Bank of England, the, the IFS, the IMF, the CBI, and five former NATO Secretary Generals all say, you, Boris and Nigel, are wrong. Why shouldn't the public trust them? And what does Michael Gove say? Well, with uh, classic eloquence, he says, I'm not asking the public to trust them. I'm asking the public to trust themselves. Because they've been wrong before, they'll be wrong again. And that's the heart of the point. He draws there, and in the rest of the interview, an explicit link to 2008 and the financial crash. That's what it's about. That's why we've had enough of experts, and including numerous other things as well. So I'll give you one example. Um, Larry Summers was the US, uh, head of the US uh, Treasury under Bill Clinton. What did he do? He deregulated finance, leading to the risky practices, which caused the 2008 financial crash. And how did he respond to uh, words of criticism of the current prevailing economic expertise? He called his opponents tech-bashing Luddites. How's that? That's not very uh, open-minded, is it? Um, and so I think, really, what's going on here is that the experts have gained a, a sense of authority by virtue of being experts, which they have used to uphold really dodgy and immoral practices, which fucked over tons of people in 2008 and on other occasions. So I think it makes me um, think of you know, those ancient stories about Zeus and Prometheus and all that stuff. Because in those ancient myths, the crime of hubris, thinking that you are invincible and you're always right, the crime for that was a punishment of fire and brimstone raining down from the gods. So I think, I think the experts need a bit of that. They haven't learned their lesson. You could say Brexit was a bit of a punch up the arse, but it, you know, I don't think it's changed the, uh, the general intellectual attitude. Um, I think, you know, they need to get off their high horse, and frankly, it's time, it's, it's time for people to start listening to voices of criticism and the voices of normal people. So, on that note, I'm going to end by saying, say no to intellectual fraud, like la what Larry Summers did to defend dodgy finance. Say no to disregarding 
normal people's voices of concern and discarding their concerns. Say no to experts. Thank you so much, Sal. I move now across to the abstentions. Your hand was up even before I finished speaking, so second to the back. If we can have name and college for the record. Diana Bridgman, Hughes Hall. Um, my gripe with proposition is that I believe in expertise, or at least I want to. I want to live in a world where I can go to an expert, they can point me in the right direction, and I will know what to do. My gripe with opposition is the very first speaker telling me about the humility of experts. Unfortunately, being at Cambridge, I do not believe in that. <laughs> They are telling us about an altruistic, humble expert that is willing to go to the government or maybe even you know, individuals and give them advice that is somehow pure. Whereas in reality, the experts, the academics, they live in an intensely political world in a bubble as well, where the decisions that they make in terms of what advice they give are intensely political. And we end up in a situation where, you know, every single time a political decision is make, made, that doesn't pan out, a ex an expert will crawl out from somewhere and saying, I told you so, whereas the decision was made in the first place with another ex expert's advice, right? So I guess what I'm getting at is, I want to believe in expertise, but like I am increasingly confused whether or not such a thing even exists. Because even with things like you know, climate change, we finally agree that something needs to be done. But like, I cannot, for the life of me, find an expert who is willing to say, like, yes, this is exactly the thing that we need to do, and I can guarantee that this will fix everything. There is so much disagreement with these things. So I guess I, just, I would love to live in a world where experts are humble, but I beg of you, academics, experts, please engage in more debate and be more humble. And all of these elaborate you know, arguments that you spend your careers constructing, be more open for them to be deconstructed. <laughs> Turning now to opposition, um, and I'll go second from the back row there. Uh, thank you. Um, Harrison at Trinity College. So we've heard many times in this debate, and I'm sure we've all seen many times in our lives, cases where, where experts have been wrong. You know, the, the current spike in inflation, which, which very few people would have predicted a couple of years ago, etc., etc., etc. But we don't need to believe that experts are infallible in order to have faith in them. We just need them to be better than the alternative. And the alternative, of course, is people who lack any expertise at all. And I d d believe that I'm generally speaking to a room full of, of undergraduate students. Would I be correct in that? Would I, would I be correct? No? Yes? No? Right. Postgrad. So there's a postgrad among us. But let's take, let's assume for the sake of my point that this is a room largely populated by um, un un undergraduates. Because um, I myself am an undergraduate, as you, can, as you can tell by the slightly gawkish expression um, and poor sense of dress. But I rocked up here about a year ago, a year ago, thinking I knew various things about my subject. Theoretical linguistics, it's wonderful. You should all read about it if you find the time. I very quickly discovered I knew absolutely nothing at all. And that is what Cambridge drills into you quite quickly. Because as much as experts, you know, there's, there's divisions amid the expert consensus, the expert consensus changes, the expert consensus is not infallible. As much as the expert consensus is imperfect, the wisdom of the people who don't really know anything at all is much, much worse. I, I'm reminded of um, a heckler who, in, during the 2017 election, shouted up at Theresa May while she was talking about GDP figures, that's your bloody GDP, not ours. Um, <laughs> If we, replay, if, if, if we say that we've had enough of experts, we should consider the implications of the alternative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harrison. I'm quite enjoying hearing from undergrads do nothing at all, so I'm going to do another round of floor speech if that's okay. Uh, back to proposition. There were quite a few hands I didn't get to. 
Um, right on the back row in the maroon. Uh, Anatoly, Queens College. Um, I'd just like to add to what the uh, second speaker for, for the proposition said. Um, I'm also not going to inveigh against all experts in general, only those who are uh, in government, those unelected who rule us. Um, the, the obvious point to make, of course, is that that is fundamentally anti-democratic. And uh, don't take it from me, folks. Take it from the uh, elephant in the room, Plato, the best critic of democracy the world ever produced, and the original and greatest advocate for rule of experts. He made a simple point. Regular people are too dumb, too inexperienced to be entrusted with the serious business of government. He says in the Republic that just as we entrust various important tasks to experts, so like sailing to captains and haircuts to hairdressers, in just the same way, we should entrust government to experts, AKA the philosophers, which in Greek just means the people who love knowledge, the people who know. This is, what, uh, this is what he lays out, and this is a political project which has rightfully been called authoritarian and even totalitarian. I would much rather trust democracy than unelected, flawed technocrats. And we've, we've seen uh, the things that I've mentioned just in this very debate, the second speaker for the opposition, the will of the people in, in, in quotes, right? No, listen to the scientists. Uh, if we are going to talk about accountability, as the second, speak the second speaker for the proposition wanted us to, do you know who's really unaccountable? The unelected Fauci's of the world, who are accountable to no one. And that's all. Please vote. Thank you so much. And for the last time, an abstention speech in the blue shirt. I saw you first. Uh, about what the experts are saying, and we come to a consensus there. Um, but I think it's very difficult to generalize in terms of the whole house, whether we have enough experts each, whether what I consider to be enough expertise, whether I want to take more, because we have a free market of ideas, if you like, on the internet. We're able to access lots and lots of expertise and contribute to our own conclusions. Uh, so if you make a norm uh, completely objective claim that we have enough, it implies there is a level of expertise that is right uh, and if we have any more or any less, we're going about it in the wrong way. So I think a motion that says uh, we have had enough of experts or we don't have enough experts is not wrong or right. It should just be uh, dismissed as a proposition. Thank you. Thank you so much. I turn now to the opposition uh, in the white jumper in the second row. Okay, really quickly. This isn't a debate about expertise. This is a debate about people being scared of how the notion of expertise is politicized for certain political programs, all right? You use experts all the time and you don't complain and you're all very happy until they tell you something that you don't like and then all of a sudden they're evil, authoritarian, unaccountable bureaucrats who are here to ruin your life and have got Boris Johnson dangling like a puppet on strings while he tries to fight for his sovereignty, okay? That's the first thing. An evil, an evil expert isn't just someone who tells you something 
you don't want to hear. That is just someone doing their job, which I get with the experience of our government, maybe an alien concept, but it is real, all right? Okay, secondly, do you know who benefits from the depiction that experts are these predatory, conspiratorial, evil people? The politicians who are enacting unpopular policies and don't want to be blamed for it so that they can be re-elected. You know what's a very easy get out of jail free card? Oh, it's these guys, it's not my fault, my hands are tied, okay? And just while we're on the topic of authoritarianism, the closest uh, instances where we've gotten to authoritarianism have been the very anti-elite populist governments that you have elected, who have claimed to be giving back control to the people, okay? It's these same guys who are, oh, okay, fine, go on. <laughs> Okay, I'm not talking about approaches. I'm trying to make a point about the whole purpose of politicization of expertise. You want to compare Australia and the UK, go for it. Not my business. I don't have that much time. All right? So, if someone... If someone is trying to turn you against experts, maybe why don't you use a bit of that critical thinking that you have as such a free agent and maybe think why they're trying to do that and maybe what they gain from that, okay? And by the way, if we're talking about loss of freedoms, perhaps some of the greatest loss of freedoms have been the medical experts who are devoting their lives to trying to, make, uh, to minimize the death toll during COVID while you guys use your free will to promote the most baseless pseudoscientific theories. It's the people who are on the front lines wearing nothing but bin bags and not sleeping during 48 hour shifts with goggle marks imprinted on their face. They're the ones that have been losing their freedom during this COVID experience. Not you guys, because you've had to sit around and watch TV at home, okay? Or bake sourdough bread. I know, it's a prison, okay? Okay. <laughs> Final point, I know, because we're running out of time. No one is saying um, that we should blindly follow experts on every single point they make. I get it, okay? They're arrogant, they're condescending, they screw up sometimes, okay? We all get that. But you know what? As another gentleman pointed out, they are wildly better than the alternative. And you know what they don't get credit for? Every single thing they do that goes right. You know why? Because it all runs smoothly, and so we don't even notice. Uh-huh. But as soon as they get something wrong, well, the Daily Mail is having a field day with that which if that is your cup of tea go for it but maybe if your primary three sources for critical thinking are the sun the daily mail and jordan peterson you should have a think about how how free that critical thinking is okay i get it experts piss you off but just because they do something you don't like it doesn't mean they're evil agents trying to control you guess what people don't like giving other people bad news they don't like telling them bad things that would ruin their lives if they're doing that you have to think about why and if they're getting blamed for that you also have to think about why i find it pretty rich we're having a lecture on free will and what the people want when i don't think any of our three past prime ministers have been remotely popular uh considering the things that they've been coming out with okay so just chill out and s start trusting your experts more Thank you so much for a really impeccable set of floor speeches across the board. You guys have a lot to live up to in closing. Um, and to do that, I'd like to welcome Lord Matt Ridley to close the case for proposition. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no. Um, Lord Ridley is a science writer, journalist, and businessman. His books, including The Red Queen, Genome, The Rational Optimist, and The Evolution of Everything, have sold over a million copies and won several awards. He has served in the House of Lords and was founding chairman of the International Centre for Life in Newcastle upon Tyne. Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you, and what a great honour to be here today. Thank you very much, and I have really enjoyed this debate so far, some fantastic contributions. Let me start by saying that, like Laura, I am a big fan of most experts, really. Like Laura, I go to a plumber when my heating breaks. Unlike her, I go to a doctor when my prostate breaks. Um, <laughs> I'm a keen supporter of vaccines. I really am. I'm passionate about this subject. So what am I doing on this side of the debate? Well, I'm fed up with people pretending to have expertise about the future. That's my issue. And then they call it the science. And it's just modeling. 
and they're tainting the reputation of real science and they're causing the very skepticism and the very vaccine hesitancy that Katie talked about so eloquently by damaging the reputation of science when they're just making forecasts and getting them wrong. Here's a couple of quotes from experts about the future. Uh, Paul Krugman won, won the Nobel Prize in, uh, and he's speaking in 1998, said, by 2005 or so it will become clear that the internet's impact on the economy is no greater than the fax machines. Steve Ballmer, the chief executive officer of Microsoft, speaking in 2007, said, there's no chance the iPhone is going to get significant market share. No chance. Right, so people get the future wrong. That's a common phenomenon, and it's my contention there is no such thing as an expert on the future. Sure, you can predict that, that on this date in 2023, the sun will rise in the east at 7.45 in the morning. But no expert, no matter how brilliant they are, is, can tell me what the weather will be like on that day, what the stock market will be doing, what the pound will be worth, um, and what will have been invented by then. In, go ahead. I'll come to that. The answer is no. <laughs> um, in complex dynamic systems, the future is not a puzzle to be solved. It's a mystery that can't be solved. Yet experts keep pretending they can solve it, and they call it modelling. Let's revisit, as the gentleman did here, what Michael Gove said in 2016 about experts. What did he actually say? He said, I think the people in this country have had enough of experts from organisations with acronyms saying they know what is best and getting it consistently wrong. So he's clearly not saying all experts are wrong. That's a straw man. He's not even saying experts from acronym organizations are wrong. That's also a straw man. He's saying that the ones who are consistently wrong should be treated with a lot less reverence. And he was talking about forecasting, about predicting the future. The track record of modelers in predicting the future of the economy, the pandemic, or the weather more than a few days or weeks ahead is truly terrible. Paul Samuelson famously joked that the stock market has forecast nine of the last five recessions. <laughs> the Queen famously asked why no economists saw the financial crisis coming. Now the experts would reply, well it's an uncertain world, but we knew that already. That doesn't get us anywhere. John Kay and Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England, in their new book, Radical Uncertainty, talking about the financial crisis, say the biggest mistake governments made was to pretend they knew more than they did. Now, here's a topical example. The Office of Budget Responsibility admitted this week that delaying the budget in the next few weeks till mid-November could allow them to find £15 billion of headroom for Rishi Sunak because they can now take into account currently falling energy prices and rising bond prices. So they aren't forecasters, they're just extrapolators. I mean, anyone can do that with a ruler. <laughs> Go ahead. So you're talking about the financial crisis. I was wondering if you could wait for us as we start and start thinking about the financial crisis and see something like maybe the cost of life or cost of life <coughs> Well, the financial crisis was uh, a big thing. I'm coming to COVID too. They're both very important examples of, uh, of uh, getting forecasting wrong. In fact, I'm about to talk about the pandemic. Here we go. Um, in a notorious press conference in October 2020, we were told by the chief scientist that 4,000 people a day might die in the coming weeks. Now, I at the time stood up in the House of Lords and said, I'm sorry, the assumptions in that forecast, are, in that model, are extremely dodgy. I was shouted down, I was told by the government minister, this was the science, I was not to interfere. Um, I was right. Those numbers turned out to be completely wrong. Imperial College's model said in June 2021 that there would be 203,824 deaths over the following year. It was way out by miles, but it was also ridiculously precise, okay? Somebody... Well, we could look at the entrails of chickens. That's what they used to do in ancient Greece. 
it's about as good as most of the modeling that's done today. Um, it's called haruspicy. Um, now, Neil Ferguson of Imperial College became very famous during this time. And remember, he's the man who predicted up to 136,000 deaths from mad cow disease. Do you know what the true number is? 187. Okay, he predicted 200 million deaths from bird flu. The number is under 200, I don't know what it is. 65,000 from swine flu. Again, he got it wrong. Now, some say, well, yes, but what you've got to take into account is the margins of error. The forecast said a middle range, but here's a top range and a bottom range, right? Well, let's do that then. In December 2021, SAGE, that government committee, said that there might be between 200 and 6,000 deaths a day. That's meaningless. I mean, that's a ridiculously wide range. It doesn't tell you anything about what policy should be. So the politically useful forecasts were wildly wrong, and the ones that got it right were politically useless. One more, and then I really want to press on. Um, th that's not entirely true, actually. Um, some of his predictions, he, he had predictions with and without lockdown in it. But interestingly, in December 2021, there was a forecast came out of SAGE, um, the modelling part of SAGE, and Graham Medley, the head of it, uh, was asked, hang on a minute, you haven't assumed, you haven't got a single scenario in here in which Omicron is mild. All your assumptions are that Omicron is worse than what came before. And he said, well, what would be the point of that? Well, the point of that might be to know what's going to happen in the future. So there was an inherent pessimism bias going on in a lot of this. Jim Lovelock, who died this year at the age of 103 um, and was a friend of mine, he said in an interview with the Bournemouth Echo, which you all read, I'm sure, that uh, anyone who tries to predict more than five to ten years ahead is a bit of an idiot. So many th things can change unexpectedly. In the early 2000s, the Met Office got themselves a big computer, a new one, and it said, now we can do seasonal forecasts. Now we can tell you whether it's going to be a hot summer or a cold summer. So in 2007, they said, there are no indications of a particularly wet summer. There were floods. In 2009, it forecast a barbecue summer with rainfall average or below average. It was one of the dullest and wettest Julys ever recorded. In September 2009, it forecast that the winter is likely to be milder than last year. It was the coldest winter in 30 years. In 2010, they forecast a 60 to 80% chance of warmer than average temperatures this winter. It was the coldest December in 100 years. Now, after that, they gave up doing seasonal forecasts. They realized it wasn't easy to do. And that's the point. Philip Tetlock of the University of Pennsylvania examined the accuracy of forecasts uh, made by experts over 20 years and found that they were little better than chimpanzees throwing darts at a chart. And worse, he found that the greater the expertise in the subject, the worse the forecasts. Taxi drivers were better at forecasting the economy than economists. Seriously, this is what he found. Why? Because the people who are closest to it are obsessed with their own speciality, their in own interest, and they give it too much weight in forecasting. Um, I'm going to press on, if you don't mind, because I, I, I'm near the end, and I, I, th I think my time is running out. Um, uh, so when challenged, modelers say, well, ah, things changed. New variants came along. But that's what the ancient Greeks used as their excuse for why the chicken entrails didn't work as well. Now, Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize-winning physicist, said science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. And what he meant is that in 1953, every expert agreed that genes were made of protein until Watson and Crick showed that, no, they were made, well, that, sorry, Oswald Avery showed that they were made of, of DNA, not protein. So, yes, there is a challenge to experts that happens um, uh, as a result of science. Now, I want to pick up on a few points that have been made in the debate so, par so far and either rebut or confirm them. <laughs> the point about Sweden is not whether you can find... Uh, whether it did better than Denmark or, or, or Finland or something, because you know it had it made mistakes in care homes too, didn't it, and things like that. 
The point is the experts were all saying Sweden's failure to lock down is going to cause a catastrophically high death rate, and it didn't. The experts were saying that. That's the point. It's not what um, happened afterwards. It's what they said at the time. Um, Katie made the point that um, virologists in a lab have no ulterior motive, and she's absolutely right. But the public expert, health experts who were put up in front of us and told us what to do were far more certain, far more censorious than the wonderful scientists she described. We need to find a way to have scientists who are on tap, not on top, on, on these kinds of things. Um, uh, now, the uh, chap raised the point about um, drugs and the overclaiming for vaccines. It is a serious problem that Anthony Fauci stood up and said again and again on television, these vaccines are going to prevent transmission. We didn't know that at the time. It was overconfident. It was wrong. That damaged faith in, va in vaccines then. Cameron. Uh, there's evidence in the CDC that they actually did prevent transmission. What, at the beginning, you mean, with the first? Throughout the pandemic, it was published a few weeks ago. Oh, no, no, he said they prevent trans transmission. You're saying they, 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 they may slow transmission. I mean, you're never going to get 100%. No, yes, you, you do with, with smallpox vaccines. Smallpox is bad. That's not the same point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, Cameron, you said that Fauci is more democratically accountable than politicians, I think, or you implied that. Well, okay. You, 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 somebody said at the back that he's not accountable, and you said, yes, he is. He's been in that job for 30 years. 30 years as head of the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, handing out billions of pounds in patronage. That's not accountability. And if experts are going to be telling us what to do, then they ha we have to be, find a way to make them accountable too. Um, and Cameron, you said quite rightly that experts can disagree, but that's exactly the point. Go ahead. So I understand you talk about a very small subset of experts. Why do you think today we're debating general experts? I don't think anyone believes that just because you're an expert, you're automatically omnipotent, omniscient, perfect human being. I don't think anyone would assume that democracy supposes that. So just because some experts fail by the mark, as all of us do in various areas of our life, I didn't say all experts are bad. I started by saying most experts are good, remember. So I agree with you. Um, but what I am saying is that the motion says, have we had enough of experts? And I have in this one specific way in which they pretend to know the future and don't. Um, now, I'm going to press on. Sorry, just I'm ne nearly finished. Um, uh, the, the, so the, the, my point is the pandemic has caused a crisis for the reputation of experts. I think we can all agree on that. I think we can all agree that there is, you know, far too much vaccine hesitancy, conspiracy theories, et cetera, et cetera. It's no good saying that's not the fault of experts at all. I think it is partly the fault of experts themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fine speech and for closing the case to proposition. I move now to the opposition and to Johan Christensen. Johan is an assistant professor at the University of Leiden. His research focuses on the role of experts and expertise in public policy making. His newest book, Expertise, Policy Making and Democracy, will be published in autumn 2020. Johan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, members of the, uh, of the House, um, for the chance to, to wrap up, I think, uh, or almost. Um, so I want you to imagine something, um, not a completely far-fetched scenario. Uh, imagine that you are a prime minister who has just come to power at the head of a government. Your government is immediately faced with a range of issues that you need to address. There are the urgent ones, such as an economic crisis, a war in a not-so-far-away country, rising prices on gas and electricity. 
There are also long, long standing problems that require your attention, um, such as uh, the emissions of climate gases or uh, the state of the education system. How do you go about dealing with these issues? You quickly realize that the overarching priorities and policy positions that you outlined in your election manifesto, if you had one, that is, will only get you so far. For each of the issues faced by your government, more information is needed. Information on the causes of the problem, on the possible courses of action, on the likely effects on the different courses of action. Um, how will it affect the international energy market if you impose a price cap on gas and electricity? What interventions will be most effective in cutting climate gas emissions? The ministers in your cabinet are all seasoned politicians with a good grasp of a range of policy issues acquired through a long political career. Most of them also have higher education, I'm sure from places like this. Yet, the combined knowledge of your cabinet is not close to sufficient to answer any of these questions. Yes. Thank you for the point, but I haven't actually said that. <laughs> I've only been talking about the political side so far. Um, so, so, so I'll move on. Um, so, so I was saying, you know, the, the combined knowledge of your cabinet is not close to sufficient to answer any of these questions. On each of these issues, you depend fundamentally on the input of experts with specialized knowledge about uh, how the human body and mind works or about how the global environment works. And um, this, members of the House, is what we can call the fact of expertise. It is a fact of politics and government today that political leaders depend on experts who can provide specialized knowledge on everything from vaccines to climate change. Societies today are so complex and specialized that government and citizens will not be able to make sound and well-founded political choices without consulting experts. And no, members of the proposition here, airline pilots, car mechanics, and plumbers are not enough. We need more experts than that. Therefore, pretending that we can somehow do without the experts is a dangerous fiction. That we can somehow replace expert knowledge with lived experience or citizen deliberations or gut feeling, as some people seem to propose, is unrealistic and will only lead to worse policies. Contemporary societies simply cannot do without experts. And this is my main point. Then, of course, there are tensions between expertise and democracy, the fact that expert knowledge is unequally distributed by definition, it is specialized, it is exclusive, raises problems for democratic systems that are based on the principle of political equality. But this is an inevitable tension in any modern democracy. Of course, experts have biases and they do make mistakes. But the answer to these problems is not to get rid of the experts. Instead, we need to deal with the problems that experts raise for democratic societies. Uh, and, and more specifically, I'll try to be as specific as possible, we need to think about how we can organize the participation of experts in policy making in ways that, on the one hand, limit the expert biases and mistakes that we've been talking about, uh, and, and maximize the benefits of listening to experts for the quality of policies. On the other hand, we need to organize expert participation in a way that, that minimizes the, the costs for democracy and equal participation. Uh, and I'd like to mention two ways this can be done, uh, and, and these points have, have um, been brought up, uh, I think, already in the discussion, and, and that is expert diversity uh, and expert accountability. So one way to avoid expert biases and, and uh, minimize democratic costs is to ensure a diversity of experts. First of all, 
uh, as has been discussed during the COVID pandemic, we saw the dangers of relying on single expert disciplines. censored anyone who speculated that it might have been a libel. Is that diversity of opinion or is that antitrust on your view? Thank you for the point. Um, well, I haven't made the point yet, but I'm, I'm going to make a point about disciplinary diversity. So, so, so not necessarily diversity of opinion in that sense. But let me make my point and then maybe you can, uh, you can come back. Um, so, so the problem was in many countries, for instance in the Netherlands where I work, uh, the exclusive reliance on medical advisors led to biases and blind spots in the advice of, of government. Uh, so uh, the advice focused exclusively on the situation in the hospitals, uh, but did not or, or, or ignored what was going on in schools, in the cultural sector, in the economy. Um, uh, and an answer to this problem is to call on the advice of experts from a range of different disciplines. That way, medical perspectives are confronted with the perspectives of child psychologists or economists. And by including a broader range of disciplinary perspectives, um, we increase uh, the chance of making uh, better decisions and uh, shedding light on more relevant aspects of the problem. But it may be equally crucial to ensure that experts are diverse along other dimensions, as, as one of the um, interveners here earlier noted. Uh, that might be in terms of gender, it might be in terms of race, it might be in terms of social background, perhaps even in terms of political views. Uh, one example from the Biden administration was his commission to look into Supreme Court reform. Uh, he, um, he, he chose to compose that commission of legal experts from as wide an ideological spectrum as possible. Uh, and the report they produced was, was quite authoritative. They didn't reach a consensus, of course, um, but, but uh, shed light on various aspects of the problem. Moving to my final point, a second way to mitigate the problems of um, expertise in democracy um, is to ensure expert accountability. So we've been dancing around this, this notion of accountability um, all, all night, so let me try to, to say what, what we can mean by expert accountability. So expert accountability requires that um, experts explain their assumptions, their evidence, the uncertainty of their estimates, goes back to the question of humility, what they know and what they do not know about um, uh, an issue. This involves transparency, it involves deliberation, uh, and it involves submitting expert judgment to review by other actors. So who exactly should experts be accountable to? There are several possible layers of accountability. Uh, most obviously, uh, you as a scientist should be accountable to your own discipline. Uh, but this principle is of course institutionalized in all academic disciplines. We have peer review uh, and mechanisms like that for ensuring, um, for ensuring accountability. I also just discussed accountability to, to other disciplines. But we can also think about experts explaining their arguments in um, even broader form. So for instance, to uh, people who have practical experience uh, or practical expertise on an issue, such as bureaucrats running programs, um, people from interest groups who have relevant knowledge about how a policy works on the ground, but also to citizens within the broader public sphere. Yes, please. Thank you for the point. That's an excellent point. Um, I think we need to distinguish two issues in a sense here. That, um, of course, a frequently raised um, criticism of, of academia is that it's, it's left-leaning, right? So, so if you ask academics to, to give advice on something, you'll not only get their expert advice, but you'll also get you know, uh, their, their ideological uh, leanings. Um, 
I think that's a valid point, and it might be a problem in, in, in some context, uh, but I think we also need to think about whether, of course, we all have political views. We all have ideological backgrounds, but we also need to think about whether those ideological and political views are actually driving the content of our advice uh, and whether that is the most important thing in deciding what we decide to advise um, or not. And in some fields, uh, that might be the case. In other fields, um, it might not. Well, I guess the things we've been, been talking about so far, so for instance, um, multidisciplinarity, people would tend to think differently. I mean, yeah. as, as opposed to having only economists on the panel, uh, if you have economists, sociologists, political scientists, there, there's bound to be some diversity uh, within uh, that group. Uh, yes, please. Yes, that's an, that's an excellent point. I, I, I embrace this very much. And it says, please conclude. So I will conclude. Um, just repeat my basic point then. We need the experts. So I would ask the House to oppose uh, the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to everyone that spoke tonight. I've really enjoyed this debate. I think it's been poignant and nuanced and really well thought through. So thanks to our paper speakers for considering your points of information and thanks to all of you for making those points. They've been brilliant. Two quick notices before we vote. We've got an extremely powerful exhibition in the library. I'd encourage everybody to go and see. It's on Afghan interpreters. It's called We're Here Because You Were There. It's curated by Andy Barnum and Dr. Sarah de Jong, and it seeks to shed light on the lasting impact of Britain's military intervention and migration policy in Afghanistan. So please go visit it. It's up in the library. It's free to enter at any time and open to people who are not members. Um, tickets for our winter ball will also come out this week, so stay tuned. They tend to like a minute, so be ready for that. Um, and then we'll move to a vote. In this house, we vote with our feet. So if you have had enough of experts, go through the eyes door. If you're um, still keen on them, nose. And if you're not sure, middle abstention door. I look forward to seeing you all in the bar.